Let's take a look at the quick ratio. The quick ratio gives students a lot of trouble. Let's talk about the very basics of it. The quick ratio is designed to show us the liquidity of the firm without taking inventory into consideration. So it's a modification of the current ratio, which is just current assets over current liabilities. Because inventory might not sell as quickly as we would like, in fact, it may be in your inventory for years. Uh, some say it might be a good idea to go ahead and subtract out the inventory before we figure out our ratio that represents short-term liquidity. And that's where we get quick ratio from. Here's the problem, though. Usually, the current assets we are given are cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. And so we add those three together to get current assets. And so we could do the following substitution. We just put in cash plus accounts receivable plus inventory for current assets. And then we subtract out inventory before dividing by current liabilities. Something fun happens here. And these two things just cancel out. And so quick ratio is actually just cash plus AR divided by current liabilities. But here is the most common mistake that students make. They say QR is equal to uh, cash plus accounts receivable minus inventory divide by current liabilities. And that is absolutely not true. You can see up here that the inventories cancel each other out. And so as long as you've got cash and accounts receivable, you don't need inventory in order to be able to calculate the quick ratio. Here is the sim simplest calculation for the total debt ratio. It's just total debt divided by total assets. But we know that total assets is equal to total debt plus total equity. So we could rearrange that equation to say that total debt is equal to total assets minus total equity. And we can make a substitution back into our formula here. Anywhere it says total debt, I can put in total assets minus total equity. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, you might say, why in the world would you do that? The answer is quite simple. When we tell students total debt, they often just put in the long-term debt and they miss the current liabilities. And so the beauty of this is that it avoids overlooking your current liabilities. Now let's talk about the equity multiplier. The equity multiplier is just the ratio of total assets to total equity. And this is often called a measure of leverage because after all, total assets here is just total debt plus total equity. The more total debt is, the higher the equity multiplier will be. In fact, let's go ahead and substitute in for total assets. I'm going to say total equity plus total debt divided by total equity. And you can see if the firm is totally financed using equity, the equity multiplier will be 1. But as we add more and more debt, the equity multiplier will start to climb away from 1. In theory, there's no limit as to how high it can go. Okay, now let's do some distributing. I can distribute here and say TE over TE and TD over TE. I haven't violated any mathematical laws by doing that and something fun happens. This thing cancels out to just become one. And so now we can say that the equity multiplier is equal to one plus total debt over total equity. And total debt over total equity, well, that is just our debt to equity ratio. I get questions about this one all the time. 
How do I find the total debt ratio given the debt to equity ratio? Well, we just got through saying that the equity multiplier is 1 plus the debt to equity ratio. And we know that that is equal to total assets over total equity. And we also know that the total debt ratio is equal to total debt divided by total assets. Now what if I were to put the debt to equity ratio on the top here and put the equity multiplier on the bottom? I haven't broken any laws because these things just cancel out and I'm left with TD over TA. So all I have to do to find the total debt ratio using debt to equity is to say TD over TE divide by the equity multiplier, which we know is 1 plus TD over TE. And this is a handy one to, to remember. It's just the debt to equity ratio divided by the 1 plus the debt to equity ratio. Two ratios we often see are inventory turns and the days in inventory. Inventory turns is cost of goods sold divided by the amount in your inventory. Now students often get confused as well as some other scholars and think that this should be sales on the top. But here's the problem. Inventory is recorded at cost. And so our measure of sales that is at cost is cost of goods sold. In order to get an apples to apples comparison, we can't put sales up here because the sales price is higher than the cost. Days in inventory is just 365 divided by inventory turns, which we just calculated up here. Where does the 365 come from? 365 days in a year. And inventory turns is also in terms of per year. And so this is why we end up with days and days sales and inventory being 365 over inventory turns. Now, what could we do to put these two equations together. Well, if we are dividing by inventory turns, that is the same as multiplying by the inverse of inventory turns. So we need to find the inverse of inventory turns. And that's just going to be inventory over COGS. So I just took this and inverted it. And now I can go back and redo my calculation and say that the days in inventory are equal to 365 times inventory divided by the cost of goods sold. Now, why is it important to be able to do this? Because many times in questions, we'll be given two of these and asked to find the third. Now that we have them all in one formula, we can solve that formula for any one of the variables in the equation. We could do something very similar with AR turns and days. AR turns are defined as sales divided by accounts receivable. And there are a couple of things to notice here. First of all, we are talking about sales, not cost of goods sold. And the reason that we're doing that is because sales and AR are at the same price. If I sell $10 worth of goods on credits, it shows up in both sales and accounts receivable as $10. So we are doing, once again, an apples to apples comparison. The second thing to note is that we are talking about credit sales, because after all, if we don't sell it on credit, it doesn't show up in the accounts receivable. Unless you're told otherwise, assume that all sales are on credit, which is actually fairly close to being true for most American businesses. Now we can find our days and accounts receivable as 365 divided by AR turns, similar to our situation with inventory. And so I can put these two equations together if I invert AR turns. So one over AR turns is just accounts receivable divided by sales. And then I can put that back into my formula to find the days 
in accounts receivable as 365 times accounts receivable divide by sales. And once again, you may find yourself doing a homework problem or a test question where you're asked to find one of these three things. And if you've got them all in this one equation, you can always solve for it. For example, sales would be 365 times AR divided by days in AR. So you just use your algebra to get the variable you want by itself. Let's talk about, about total asset turnover. It's defined as sales divided by total assets. If we are given total debt and total equity, we can rewrite this because total assets is equal to total debt plus total equity. So we could rewrite total asset turnover to be sales divide by total debt plus total equity, just using the substitution principle. What if we were given profit margin and net income? Well, we know that profit margin is equal to net income over sales. And so we can solve that for sales and say that it is net income over profit margin. And so we can substitute that back into our equation and say that this is actually net income divided by profit margin times total assets, or we could say net income divided by profit margin times parentheses total debt plus total equity. Now we are going to find ROA, ROE, and EPS given sales and profit margin. So ROA is net income divided by total assets. ROE is net income divided by total equity. And EPS is net income divided by the number of shares. What do these things all have in common? Net income. If we're given sales and profit margin, we can actually find net income because profit margin is equal to net income over sales. And so we can just say that net income is equal to profit margin times sales. And so now using the substitution principle, I can plug in profit margin times sales anywhere I see net income. Let's start with ROA. So now we have profit margin times sales over total assets. Well, sales over total assets is actually something called total asset turnover. And so we could say that ROA is simply the profit margin times total asset turnover. And then we can do something similar with ROE. It's profit margin times sales divided by total equity. And we can do a little magic with it too. What if we take profit margin times total asset turnover times TA over TE? Well, we know this gives us net income over total assets. And so by multiplying by total assets, dividing by total equity, now we have net income over total equity, which is our ROE. And it turns out this thing has a name too, and that's the equity multiplier. And in fact, this is the DuPont equation, the DuPont identity, ROE is equal to profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. Finally, we can substitute into EPS. We now know that net income is profit margin times sales, and that is just divided by the number of shares outstanding at the firm.
We just got through talking about the DuPont identity and how it is profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. Let's walk through the algebra to make sure you understand why that is. First of all, we know that ROE has to be equal to net income divided by total equity. And so what we want to do is go through this and make sure that's exactly what is happening. So let's start with profit margin. It's just net income divided by sales. Total asset turnover is sales divided by total assets. And the equity multiplier is total assets divided by total equity. Okay, so now we can go back and prove that this thing is actually net income divided by total equity. I cancel out sales because it's on top and bottom, and I do the same thing for total assets, and I am left with net income over total equity, which is actually our definition of ROE. Now we'll show how to get the P-E ratio if you're given net income and the number of shares outstanding. Here's our formula for P-E. It's just the share price divided by the earnings per share. We also know that the earnings per share is equal to net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. And so since EPS is on the bottom here, we need to invert it. 1 over EPS is equal to the number of shares divided by net income. And now we can multiply this times the share price to get to PE. Okay, so what we're really left with here is then the market value of the equity divided by net income. So, so PE is basically done with per share values, price per share and earnings per share. And the way that we have come to here gives us the market value of the total equity of the firm divided by the total earnings of the firm. And so it's basically as if the number of shares outstanding have just been canceled out. The market to book ratio is simply the market value of the firm's outstanding stock, here's called the market value of equity, divided by the book value of the equity. The market value of the equity, as we just mentioned, is the share price times the number of shares outstanding. What about the book value of the equity? Well, all we have to do is think back to our balance sheet equation that the owner's equity is equal to assets minus liabilities. And so we're basically just going to be taking the book value of the assets minus the book value of the liabilities. Now, where would I find book values of these things? In the books, of course. In this case, it's going to be on the balance sheet. Here's a really tough one to manipulate. It's internal growth rate. This is the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm based on internally generated equity only. And it's equal to ROA, which is return on assets, times B, which is the plowback ratio. That's just the addition to retained earnings for the period divided by the net income for the period. It's also one minus the dividend payout ratio. On the bottom, we have one minus ROA times B. And so ROA times B actually shows up twice in this equation. What if I were to ask you to solve for B? Most people would have a lot of problem with that, but the trick is you just take it one step at a time. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is multiply both sides by one minus ROA times B. Next, I'm going to distribute IGR on the left-hand side. Now I want to get all of my ROA times Bs on the same side. And so I'm going to add IGR times ROA times B to both sides. <laughs> 
Now I can see that I have ROA times B in both of these terms, so I'm going to factor that out. Now I can finally get B by itself. I'm going to divide both sides by ROA times 1 plus IGR. I'm also going to switch sides here because that's how we normally report these things is with the variable on the left hand side. So B is equal to IGR divided by ROA. I divided by ROA and I also need to divide by 1 plus IGR. And so that is how I would get B by itself. Now you may notice that it would be easy enough for us to have gone from this step to saying that ROA is equal to IGR divided by B times 1 plus IGR. Because all we've done here is multiplied both sides by ROA and divided both sides by B from this formula. Here we have the sustainable growth rate, which looks suspiciously like the internal growth rate. There are only two differences. Number one, we're saying sustainable growth rate over here. And number two, instead of ROA, we've got ROE. And so we can treat this formula exactly the same way that we treated IGR by merely swapping out ROE for ROA and IGR for SGR.